The human soul is that part of us which we have never seen, for which we can give no name, but upon which we have bestowed an innumerable number of names. The soul is that part of the individual which is the savior of the life. And in most of the mystical systems of antiquity, the soul or the anima becomes the blessed demoiselle. It also, in a larger sense, is the anima or activating soul of Christianity. It is this soul power which is the invisible beauty, the eternal feminine, the power that is built up and has always been resembled, represented in feminine form. This uh, soul, then, becomes the heroine of the story, and life is nothing but a dedication to the perfection of the soul. It means that the individual must give up every action, every thought, every attitude which conflicts with the integrity of his own soul. His own soul demands and accepts nothing except good. The, the soul is without any ulterior motive. The soul is without any pretense. And the soul offers no reward actually to the person except the realization that it is the proper thing. The uh, service of the soul, as Dante points out, therefore is not an exceptional thing. It is not an heroic thing. It is not something for which we should be forever compensated. It is not something that justifies our belief that we are on our way to a heavenly state. It is simply the fact that obedience to the soul, the elevation of the labors of the soul above the mind and above the body, is natural. It is the normal course, and anything else is abnormal or subnormal. The individual who is right is normal. And, to, and a, it is a mistake to say that normal means to share in the common delinquencies. We may say that persons with various degrees of sharing with their own mistakes belong to an average. The average person does one thing or does another thing. But average and normal are not synonyms. The average may be comparatively low, but the normal is higher than the average person has ever been able to reach. So the normal becomes the perfect acceptance of the pure love of the soul and the bestowal of all love upon the soul and its labors and all outside persons and objects that are desirable, that are worthy of our affection and worthy of our service and worthy of our sacrifice, are in some way aspects of our own soul power. The soul, therefore, is the mistress of life. It is the power by means of which we do all things well, whereas for the most part up to the present we have been doing them rather badly. The actual, having, the, the living of a principle makes all things right. In this principle there may be tears, there may be hours of sorrow, there may be losses. Life will not run along perfectly smooth for a person who feels deeply or who takes a very sincere and dedicated interest in life. The more serious we become, the more we can be hurt. Uh, the more dedicated we become, the more we can suffer from the insults and thoughtlessness and cruelty of other people. We are very, very sensitive. But the sensitivity which permits us to suffer is also the sensitivity that brings with it the internal enlightenment. Unless the person is sensitive, the overtones do not come through. But the person who is sensitive and is able to register the overtones is also hurt uh, by the profaneness of mortal existence. Oh, this is part of a mystical type of life. It has been true of mystics since the beginning, that they have paid for their insight by having an understanding or a realization of values that brings with it a certain amount of pain, a certain amount of, uh, of disappointment, and uh, in many instances, 
many flowings of tears and grief. But it is all worthwhile because without this, there is no way of bringing about the, the regaining of paradise. In the Divine Comedy, Beatrice, who is the symbol of the soul, the eternal feminine, and an embodiment of the Virgin Mary, Beatrice becomes his guide in Paradiso. As he has wandered through the underworld with Virgil, he comes finally to the better world, and here he is led by Beatrice through the various regions that lead ultimately uh, to the supreme heavenly abode. Therefore, as the soul, of course, Beatrice becomes the leader of the redeemed, becomes this power which leads the individual in the afterlife because he has attained the power of it in the present life. If he lives in this world according to the power of his own soul, he can face the future without fear, for the soul he has fashioned here will serve him hereafter. The soul, then, is the primary factor in the situation and of course is also the primary objective of the alchemist was the creation and integration of the power of the soul as the universal medicine for the corruptions of the flesh. The Greeks had their own understanding of soul. Modern psychologists have theirs also. But I think the real answer lies in the fact that the soul is something that not, is not fashioned primarily at a particular moment in life. I rather like to feel with certain of the classical thinkers uh, that the soul is that part of us which really carries the record from one embodiment to another and so on. All embodiments in the flesh are, are actually necessary to the gradual unfoldment of the soul power. Therefore, in the presence of any emergency, in this world, the soul carries the record of the most that we have ever learned in the great cycle of embodiments. All the learning of the, our past lives, all the wisdom we have gained, all the mellowing and fulfilling we have known, and all through our growth in nature, is finally epitomized and summarized in the present state of the human soul. Therefore, the soul is wiser than the mind. The soul is far older than the body, and the soul alone provides us with this mysterious power of conscience, by means of which we remember dimly what is wrong, although we may not have any detail. The soul convicts us when we betray it, or betray any other part of our natures, or any condition of life, although contrary to the common good. When man was fashioned, the soul potential as a seed, according to Bainby, was planted in his heart. These are also the Buddha seeds referred to in Buddhism. The soul is a seed originally, but if it is nursed and cared for, it grows into a beautiful plant, and this plant in turn becomes a great tree, and this tree bears many manner of fruit, and the fruit is for the healing of the nations. The soul tree, therefore, with its roots in the heart, becomes the shade under which we can all rest in peace, or the palm in the desert, in the oasis. And the soul is the private, personal oasis. And in the world, the soul is a civilization or culture that is founded upon the integrities of life. Soul power uh, virtues in a person are, repre are represented by a kind of of self-discipline in which the individual restrains and restricts destructive attitudes, in which he determines to do that which is closest to the common good. We must try to move our way of life from a purely mental focus to a heart understanding. In, in uh, Asia, the Buddhist philosophy is called the heart doctrine. And the heart doctrine in the East has always been recognized as paramount. It has always been accepted that all mind and all mentation 
has as its primary purpose to find ways to fulfill the ideals of the heart. The heart is the true leader, not the mind. But where the heart is perverted or left unenlightened, it can be troublesome also. But an undeveloped heart in an undeveloped mind is an impossible combination and is bound to produce trouble. So in uh, Dante's uh, understanding of this mysticism, the secret allegiance of the human being to the way of his own heart, an allegiance he tells to no one. He tells no one who his true love is. He would never in any way desecrate the object of his affection by associating himself with it. He knows that he is imperfect and he is not going to damage the reputation of truth by claiming to possess it and then not live it. So in silence, in complete absence of personal acclaim or recognition, he quietly venerates truth, lives with it, assumes it to be the great love of his life, cherishes it, protects it, but is silent, only showing it by his attitude in various respects but never proclaiming his true devotion. He doesn't tell other people that he is in love with truth, because if he does and makes a few bad mistakes, people will say truth is wrong. He is not going to disfigure the reality by claiming to possess it, but he is going to glorify it by continuing to serve it, day and night, life after life, until through complete um, submission to the divine plan and the divine purpose by accepting humbly the wisdom of God and the love of God he is prepared for the next step in the great development of human life and human purpose so Dante takes this attitude very very clearly he is also involved with another interesting factor and that is that Amor, or Cupid, as it was known in the Greek mythology, who is more or less the deity presiding over love, is male, not female. But Cupid is God as love. In other words, Cupid becomes the divine attribute of love. God, the attribute of love as it is in the divine nature pure, uncontaminated, and undefiled. It is the divine power as love. And as love, it is the source of all the messianic saviors. Love as the redeeming power within the nature of deity itself. Therefore, in a sense, love is the second aspect of deity. It is also the only begotten of the Father. Love, therefore, enters into the life of Dante as a mysterious being. And this mysterious being is the one that guides him and guards him in his relationships with Beatrice. It, uh, Beatrice becomes, therefore, the symbol or the embodiment of the vision that true love as the God power has bestowed upon Dante. In other words, love in its perfect nature has made it possible for him to love something. And this love of something or someone is made possible because God is love. And therefore it is not a, an, an, uh, an accidental thing. Love is not dependent upon the human being for its survival. It is part of the divine nature. Worlds come and go. Continents rise and fall. Even space itself is ch constantly changing its complexion. But the supreme power governing all things governs with love and wisdom. And this love is the eternal rightness of things, which Dante gradually comes to understand. And it is this love which is God which he is able to manifest through himself in his love for Beatrice. Beatrice, therefore, signifies 
the proper object of divine love. It represents the symbol of the purpose of love. The purpose of love is to bestow. Love is not something that locks itself within itself and stays there. It must manifest. And the divine love, which is placed in the human heart, manifests through love of something. Love of peace, love of good, love of virtue, love of friend, love of family. The love principle becomes the basis of the growth of the soul power in the person. Therefore, this character appears and floats through Dante's book, always bearing witness to the fact that it is because love exists that the human being can love. It is because love is the strong, one of the strongest laws in the universe that it becomes the criterion of all accomplishment. If it was not that love is eternal, all things of themselves would be exhausted in their efforts to develop integrities and values. Love is not mental primarily, nor is it amental. It is not against the mind, but love expresses through the regenerated mind. It recognizes the regenerated emotions and in a strange way in nature itself in natural processes the eternal love operates in the maintenance of the human body also love is the thing by means of which all motivation is brought about motivation to return to God and that which is against this motivation is against God now, man being a frail creature and imperfect in all his parts is unable sometimes to handle the mystery of love. It becomes too complicated for him. He mixes it up with passion or lust or greed. He well loves worldliness, which in itself is an anachronism. But he has within himself the capacity for the true ideal affection which is represented in Dante's book. Dante experienced it in himself as a mystical experience. He found it not in the world, but in himself. It was in his dreams that the perfect devotion was revealed. It was in dreams beyond this world that that which must come to this world first appeared. Therefore, in Dante's idea, or ideal, the eternal beauty, which we must ultimately cultivate, is first available only as a mystical experience within ourselves. The beginning of true love is a mystical experience within the person. It is something which can be experienced only in vision, in some strange emergency, in a great tragedy or disaster in which the person has to retire into himself to gain the strength of survival. Therefore, the true affection is a kind of archetypal thing found first in dreams. But from the dream, it is gradually transmitted into a more tangible form. But this mysterious love is forever limited or localized to an inward experience. It is something that happens inside. It cannot be clearly communicated in words, it cannot be demonstrated alone by action. Though to understand it or to accept it, you must meet it on its own level. And this the average person cannot do. The person may be grateful for the kindness of another, but this gratitude may not in any sense touch the core of himself in which he would find the kinship of two, true minds or true hearts. So to us, the things we try to do nicely are simply episodes, they're incidents, they're natural tendencies. It is natural for parents to love their children. It is natural for us to be kind to our friends. But it is also, unfortunately, too natural to us to be unkind to our enemies. And in this state of affairs, we prove that we do not understand the deeper meaning of the ideals of that we even find in the Sermon on the Mount. Do good to those that despitefully use you. 
This is a statement from the soul, but very few people are willing to justify it by backing it up mentally or physically. It remains a beautiful abstraction. We have not recognized it yet as an absolute necessity. Out of the whole concept, then, there is a maturing of life. And this maturing of life is gradually a transformation by which we ascend from our present objective focus to a way of leadership in which we become the servants of the divine love of God, in which everything that comes through us is already completely transformed so that every action is an extension of the divine power through our own lives. It is gradually becoming possible for us to be, li be led by the soul in the ways of righteousness. It is possible for us to shift from the selfishness that we now nourish to the divine plan for which we were intended. And the key to this is our power to express devotion, dedication. And the emotion that leads to this, the only acceptable emotion in nature, is the emotion of the love of man for the divine. And that this love for the divine, by natural extension, extends into all things that are fashioned by the divine. Therefore, to love God is to love all creation and all creatures, including the enemies. It is part of our possibility, then, to build a world around conscience, around soul extension and soul power, a world that shall sometime find the answers which it is seeking today. We are gravely worried at the moment because of the dangers of a nuclear holocaust or a danger of the pollution of our world. All such infirmities and miseries have their origin in human selfishness. These are not the manifestations of the love of one human being for another or the love of any human being for God. These are manifestations of self-interest. They are the power that has resulted, as uh, we learn in St. Augustine, in transforming the city of God into the city of death. We have transformed heaven into a Babylon. And that which was intended to be a beautiful place where we could grow together in righteousness has been corrupted by our own selfishness. And selfishness is both mental and emotional. Mental is the incentive. Mental is the justification. Mental is the conspiracy of working out how to attain these ends. But emotion is also the appetites by means of which we justify the conspiracies of the mind. We say to ourselves, I want this. This is emotional. Therefore, we say, in this way I can get it. And that is mental. And in this problem of decision, we are very seldom strictly ethical. We make compromises of all kinds to justify our own purposes. So we have to overcome this in one way or another. Either have, to have change forced upon us or make the change by the strength of character within ourselves. Dante's idea is very simple on this matter. Truth is something very beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing imaginable. Just exactly what it is and how to define it is not really very easy to say. Uh, but Dante defines it as the absolute object of all human search. He defines it, therefore, in the most perfect form that he can imagine it, and that is the form of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin of the world, the perfect virtue, the perfect good, the Eternal Mother, that which is forever provident, that which is forever meditating upon the well-being of its offspring everywhere, the Protectress, the Enlightener, the leader of the whole program of redemption, in which it is the love of the Great Mother that would make the world safe for all her children. So Dante takes this symbol under the name of Beatrice, 
which was not incidentally the actual name of the young lady who was supposed to be involved. But Beatrice was good because it goes with Beatitude and all the terms that have to do with grace. But in uh, this case, he has created an image like a, a, a very um, wonderful mandala, a, a sacred symbol to represent the eternal mother of life as manifested through this beautiful person in whom all the virtues of life he feels are personified. Therefore, he adores this. He worships it. He grieves over it. He grieves after having it de being deprived of it. But finally, when Beatrice in his vision, the perfect symbol in his vision, dies, he is not as disconsolate as might be seemed, because she is the soul. And if the soul dies, he feels that when the time comes, he will go for a fourth and join her. And that together, as in the divine comedy, they will advance to paradise or to the heavenly region, because she, as love, will lead him there. He cannot go alone. This type of symbolism has so many amplifications and so many ramifications, weeks, months can be spent in trying to interpret all of its mystery. But it tells us, as for another thing, for example, that Dante realizes that within his own masculine body is a feminine soul, that he is in a strange way an androgen already, that the, that the woman in him is there, and that that represents the best part of himself, and that therefore in obeying the feminine or anima of his own nature, he is fulfilling the divine plan, because it is this which will lead him. All that is worthwhile will come from his own soul, from that which is the inner part of his own life. And if he is led by the inner part, he will go in glory. If he is led by the outer part, he will suffer uh, through ages of vicissitudes. So all of these elements have their own little sense and line, and occasionally, and quite regularly in fact, in the uh, Vita Nova, he writes a little sonnet or a little love poem to this mysterious lady. He also writes some music to her. He is forever honoring her, wishing her all joy and peace. But he never sends her the poems. No, that wouldn't be proper. He simply keeps them. Uh, he has expressed his devotion, but he never sends the letter to the Beatrice. Rather, he has discovered that in the poem or in the sonnet, which he has written with his mind, he is actually paying tribute to his own soul. That the mind has written its poem, the hand has traced the letters, but the soul alone knows what it means. And that this secret meaning is life, his daily actions, he does not fully understand. He never would possibly write him and pass on the information, but the action which he makes, the dedicated effort that he is constantly engaged in of venerating, worshipping, and respecting his own soul, the soul itself will know. It doesn't have to be told. He does not have to receive the message, because it, the message is written out of its own content out of the soul's own appreciation of things. So Dante has a little private world of his own, which he lived in and in which he died, a world in which his entire life, or the most of it at least, was devoted to the strange mystical inner experiences which he passed through along the way, experiences which taught him uh, that somewhere inside of himself was the virgin of the world, worthy of all respect, and somewhere in space was the mother of mysteries, and that this whole great pageantry of love is an eternal mother principle manifesting through a world created for the purpose of sharing in the beauties and graces of heavenly insight, that the whole world is a great family 
and that the fatherhood of God and the motherhood of God are one thing. The wisdom and love rule all things, and if man will obey these principles and rescue the feelings, the emotions of them from within himself, he will be so busy worshiping the beautiful and recognizing the good that he will have little time for complaint or for any of the negative attitudes and doubts and fears. Dante, Dante had his doubts and his fears, but he took them to the eternal feminine and she brought him peace. We take our problems to the soul within us. If it understands and we permit, it will bring us peace. And it also gradually will bring the world peace and make possible a world for those who come after us that is far better than anything we have ever known. I think it's a, a very interesting point of view as expressed in the story of the new life, the life of love in a world of uncertainties. Well, friends, I guess that's all for this morning.